Hi everyone and welcome to the Oklahoma Hall of Fame and Gaylord Pickens Museum's virtual summer Thursdays. We're so excited you guys are here and can't wait to get started. We want to take a brief second to say thank you to our sponsors with the Chickasaw Nation and the Inasmuch Much Foundation for making free family programming in 2020 possible. So today is Explorers Day. We're really happy you guys are here. We want to tell you guys a little bit about us first. So this is our awesome building here in Midtown, Oklahoma City. Uh, we love this building and love the stories that we get to share in it and all the fun programs and exhibits that we get to do with you guys. We can't wait until we can all be back together again and start celebrating Oklahoma's heritage. So as you guys know, stories are what we do. We tell Oklahoma's story through its people and today was inspired by Oklahoma Hall of Fame member, Reggie Witten. So Reggie Witten is a lawyer by trade, but in his spare time, He's worked with the same noble Oklahoma Museum of Natural History to, found, um, to start up a couple of educational programs called Explorology and Native Explorers. He works really hard all around the world um, uh, with, with these groups to make all of these um, fun educational programs possible. So these programs are dedicated to making science and archaeology fun for students just like all of us. All right, so we're going to jump right into story time. Today we are reading The Magic School Bus Inside the Earth. All right, let's see here. I'm going to switch over so you guys can see the book as I read. All right. Okay, The Magic School Bus Inside the Earth. All right. It's your turn to be the ant monitor, Arnold. The ant monitor isn't always like this in Miss Frizzle's class. You'll get used to it. In Miss Frizzle's class, we had been learning about animals' homes for almost a month. We were pretty tired of it, so everyone was happy when Mrs. Frizzle announced, today we're starting something new. We are going to study about our earth, said Miss Frizzle. She put us to work writing reports about earth science. And for homework, she said, each person must find a rock and bring it to school. But the next day, almost everyone had some excuse. I couldn't find any rocks. I found one, but my dog ate it. Your dog ate a rock? Only four people had done the homework, and Phil was the only one who had found a real rock. All right, this guy drew a rock. All right. I guess we'll have to go on a field trip and collect rocks, said Miss Frizzle. Do you guys, do you guys know what Miss Frizzle's field trips are like? They're pretty interesting. You'll never know what will, you never know what will happen on a trip with Miss Frizzle. Her new dress was a trip itself. At first, the old school bus wouldn't start, but finally, we were on our way. Where we, when we came to the field, all the kids wanted to get out of the bus, but suddenly, the bus began to spin like a top. That sort of thing doesn't happen on most class trips. Do you guys see it spinning? Uh-oh. When the spinning finally stopped, some things had changed. We all had on new clothes, the bus had turned into a steam shovel, and there were shovels and picks for every kid in the class. Start digging, yelled Miss Frizzle, and we began making a huge hole right in the middle of the field. All right, you see them all digging here? First, we will dig through the Earth's crust. The top layer of the crust is soil. Dirt is another word for soil. All right. Before long, clunk, we hit rock. The Frizz handed out jackhammers and we began to break through the hard work. Can you guys imagine going on a school trip where they give you a jackhammer? Hey, these rocks have stripes, said a kid. Miss Frizzle explained that each stripe was a different kind of rock. We chipped off pieces of the rocks for our class rock collection. These rocks are called sedimentary rocks, class, said Miss Frizzle. There are often fossils in sedimentary rocks. All right, see how this one has a leaf in it? Can you guys see that right there? All right, that's the limestone has a fossil of a seashell in it. That's because limestone is made of shells all pressed together. Millions of years ago, there was a sea here. Wouldn't you know it, just when we were finding lots of fossils, Miss Frizzle said, back on the bus, kids. Then as we were driving along, we heard rock come crumbling underneath us. Down we went. Everything was pitch black and we were falling, falling, falling. Can you guys see the bus falling through this hole right here? How crazy is that? Class, we're going deeper into the earth. I'd rather be going back to school. 
All right. We landed with a bump. Miss Frizzle switched on the headlights. We had fallen through a hole into a huge limestone cave. Rainwater has been dripping down through the earth for ages, said Miss Frizzle. The water wore away this cave in the rock. We wanted to stay for a while, but suddenly the bus sprouted a drill. It started boring through the rock. Frizzy shouted, follow that bus, and down we went. Can you guys see the drill on the front of the bus right there? The farther down we went, the hotter it got. The rocks were harder too. These are rocks that were changed from one kind to another kind by heat and pressure, explained the frizz. Rocks that were changed are called metamorphic rocks. All right. We went down even farther toward the center of the earth. We hit rock that was formed billions of years ago from a pool of melted rock. Under the earth's surface, rock like this is called igneous rock. We had dug all the way through the crust, through the, through the earth's crust. It was so hot now that Miss Frizzle told us to get back on the bus. She stepped on the gas and the bus started really drilling. Soon we were actually inside the earth. It was hot, hot, hot. And it got hotter and hotter as we zoomed toward the center. All right, can you guys see the bus right here? They're right here right now. They're in the mantle and they're headed straight for it. They're gonna go to the inner core. They're here and they're gonna come right on out. We were glad when Miss Frizzle headed out again. We reached the Earth's crust and drove straight up through a tunnel of black rock. It was great to see the sky. Then we looked around. We had come out on an island in the middle of the ocean. Isn't this wonderful class, said Frizzy. We'd driven right up on a volcanic island. It didn't look like much, but if Miss Frizzle was right, the whole island was one big volcano. We were nervous, but Miss Frizzle made us collect some rocks. She said they had all hardened from melted rock that had come out of the volcano. Then suddenly, we heard rumblings from below. We scrambled into the bus. The Frizz turned the ignition key and stepped on the gas. Nothing happened. The bus wouldn't start. We thought we were goners. Red hot lava came streaming out of the volcano. Some of it shot into the air like a fountain. Some of it flowed over the land like a river. Our bus went along with it right into the sea. When the red hot lava hit the water, it made a huge cloud of steam. All we could see was the white. All we could see was white. We seemed to be rising with the steam and floating along. No one knows how long we floated in the cloud. But when it finally cleared, we were back in the school bus parking lot. It had been a weird trip, but we did get a great rock collection in our classroom. You guys see their rock collection here? They've got limestone and marble, slate, obsidian, all kinds of fun stuff. All right. Well, guys, that was a crazy field trip, wasn't it? Okay, well, the next thing we're going to do is we are going to jump in and make our own fossils now that we've learned about how fossils and rocks kind of go together. All right. So the, we're going to get all of our supplies. We need cardstock. We need these marbles like this where they're flat on the bottom. We're going to need some crayons and we're going to need glue stick and scissors. So the first thing we want to do is I am going to trace my three marbles on here. That way I know exactly what size it is. So I can draw my fossil and make sure it's the right size. I'm gonna do them, I'm gonna use all three of them and I'm gonna use different colors too. Okay, I'm gonna give myself lots and lots of room here. Okay, got that one. Give myself plenty of room, that way I can cut around them. Okay, so now that we've got all three of our fossils traced, we're going to design our own fossils. So you can put bugs or leaves or whatever you can think of, and that way, that way, when you see it, we can cut it out. We're going to glue it onto here, and we're going to have our own fossils, all right? Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I think I'm going to do a butterfly on one. All right, what kind of fossils are you guys going to do? These are gonna turn out great. And then you just color them. 
and put lots and lots of color on them. That way you guys can see them through the glass, okay? So make sure you can see your butt. You can see whatever you draw on here through the glass. So you want to color in the background. And don't be afraid to color hard. If you'd rather use markers, you can. That would work too. Or colored pencils, all right? Okay. Got to color the inside of it too. I think he should have a red body. What are you guys putting in yours? We can do leaves or bugs or anything. Anything we can think of. Everything fossilized, lots of things fossilized, so there are no rules on what we draw in our fossils. Plus, it's craft time, so we get to do whatever we want when it comes to what we draw, right? All right, I think I'm going to give mine some polka dots, too. All right, we're getting closer. I'm going to do this one and cut it out and show you guys, and then how to finish it up, and then I'm going to pass this, gonna pass it over to my friend Miss Allison from, our, from another organization called Thick Descriptions, and they are going to teach us all about something else that occurs on our Earth that we can go exploring for right here in Oklahoma. So after that, we are going to learn from Miss Allison all about bats and where to find those. And then she's even going to make bats with us. All right. You're almost done here. Okay, I've got my first one done. So I'm going to go ahead and cut it out and show you guys how to do it. And then you can work on all of your other ones, all right? All right, make sure to cut real close to that line because you want to make sure it fits on the bottom. You want to make sure it fits on the bottom of your rock, okay? All right, so now that we've got that done, so you want to think about how you're going to glue it because you want it to face up like that, right? And you might need to trim it a little bit, and that's okay. If you need help trimming it, make sure to grab a grown-up if you do, okay? Okay, so we're going to take our glue stick. And we're going to put glue all over the top of our cardstock where we just colored. It'll kind of make your, this is why I wanted you guys to color real hard because it's going to kind of dim those colors just a little bit, all right? And then you're going to lay that back down and you just take your rock just like this and place it over the top. And then I want you to press really, really hard and count to 10, okay? So make sure you press real, real hard. All right, and now we've got our own fossil. You guys see my butterfly in there with the polka dots and everything? I need to do some trimming right here, but I'm going to wait until it dries so I can trim it up just a little bit, okay? All right, guys. Well, I'm going to pass it over to my friend Allison over at Thick Description so she can teach us all about bats here in Oklahoma. Hello, everybody. My name is Miss Allison, and I am with Thick Descriptions. Today's lesson is going to be about the Selman Bat Caves near Freedom, Oklahoma. Um, I'm so excited to be with you guys. I hope that you enjoy this lesson and you learn a lot. Again, I am Miss Allison. I am a fifth grade science teacher at a middle school in um, central Oklahoma City. Um, I have worked for th Thick Descriptions. This is my third summer. So this is my third year. Um, we work throughout Oklahoma, um, the metro area. So like Midwest City, Oklahoma City. We, we are in Shawnee, Tulsa, Bowley, Oklahoma. Um, we work with students during break. So fall break, summer break, spring break. We are actively engaged in teaching culturally. Um, centered lessons that have to do with anthropo anthropology and science. Um, today's lesson is about bats and exploring how they are a part of Oklahoma. Um, today's lesson will also include a video from Animal Wise on YouTube and a News OK video with the actual park ranger from the Wildlife Center 
at um, the Silverback Caves, the Alab Alabaster, Alabaster Caverns. Um, and then we also have a bat craft. So I'm very excited to get started with you guys. The first thing I wanted to show you was the bat's wing. So bats um, take flight and although they are much like birds, they actually have digits that are part of their wings. So they have a forearm, they have different parts of their wings. Um, this was just a cool picture to me. They also have feet that they hang on things with and a tail. Bats eat several things. It depends on the type of bat that there is. Um, we will watch a video from Animal Wise in a second. Um, they can eat fruits and vegetables. They will eat fish sometimes. Some bats eat insects and some bats feed on small mammals and they feed on blood. Bats are nocturnal animals that can majestically dodge objects mid-flight via hypersensitive hearing. However, they are often clumsy during the day when light intimidates them. Throughout history, bats have been associated with various supernatural beings and were believed to feed in the blood of unfortunate human beings. But what do bats actually eat? Animal Wise explains all. Characteristics and habitat. The characteristics and habitat of bats are closely related to their way of life and diet. To know what they eat, we need to get to know them a little better. Bats, a type of animal known as Chiropteran, are one of the few flying mammals. As a nocturnal animal, they mainly orientate themselves via echolocation, using ultrasound to bounce off objects and create an echo. Their large ears receive the echo and send a signal to the brain, transforming it into a sonic image. Additionally, they're... So just real quick. Echolocation means that because they are nocturnal, they do only they cannot see. So they use an echo system, which means that they'll they'll speak out loud, and the sound waves that bounce off the objects near them tell them which direction to go and if they will run into anything or if they need to go a different direction. Chiropterous wings help them to skillfully dodge objects. In terms of habitat, these animals are distributed throughout the world. Some live in abundance, others are only found in very specific ecosystems. During the day, they remain hanging upside down in dark and cool places such as caves, tree hollows and gaps in human constructed edifices. When night falls, they go in search of food, although not always in winter since some bat species hibernate. Some of these mammals migrate to other climates between summer and winter, being able to cover over 1,000 kilometers on each trip. However, others prefer to remain in the same place year-round especially if their food source is abundant. Bats can be classified into the following types according to their diet. But before continuing, don't forget to subscribe to the Animal Wise channel to stay up to date on all wild and domestic animals. And for more information, visit our website at www.animalwise.com. Insectivorous bats. As the name indicates, these are bats with a diet based on insects, mainly moths and flying beetles. They can also hunt other arthropods such as spiders. Some prefer to live over rivers in search of insects associated with water, such as flies and mosquitoes. One of the best known insectivorous bats is the common pipistrel, a regular tenant in residential roofs. Fruit bats. Fruit is the main foodstuff of fruit bats, something very abundant in tropical climates. Occasionally, they may supplement their diet with insects or pollen. An example of this type of bat is the common fruit bat, abundant in South and Central America. Nectar eating bats. Many species of bat feed in the nectar of some flowers, which open only at night. The plants which make up these flowers have a symbiotic relationship with the bats since they pollinate them. However, some also eat the pollen, leaves, or even the flowers of said plants. The southern long-nosed bat is one of the best known due to both its migrations and consumption of agave nectar. Vampire bats. Bats that feed on blood are known as vampires and are the origin of the mythical beings of the same name. The common vampire bat is one of the most abundant and feeds in the blood of other invertebrates. A curious fact is that this bat regurgitates some of the blood they ingest to share with their vampire companions. Fish eating bats. 
known as piscivores, these bats feed on freshwater fish during the dry season. However, during the rainy season, they mainly feed on insects. Very occasionally, they will also eat scorpions, crabs and tadpoles. If you want to meet other exotic animals, here and in the description, we leave you a playlist so you can meet curious animals and their characteristics. What did you think of this video? Did you know that there were so many types of bats? If you liked it, don't forget to give us a like and write. What did you think of the video? So I love, love, love watching videos in my science class. Um, sometimes seeing it makes all the difference for students and for you guys to actually see what's going on and, and see the different types of things that bats actually eat and be able to put yourself into that position. So I hope that you enjoyed that video. So for Oklahoma, um, in April of 2006, Governor Henry designated the Mexican free-tailed bat as the state's flying mammal. There are actually five locations in the state that these bats migrate and hibernate to in fall and winter. Um, when, in, in the spring, I'm sorry. So in fall and winter, these bats are um, found in Mexico. And then in the springtime, they migrate to Oklahoma so that they can have their babies. So um, when the females are pregnant, they reach their caves where they gather in large numbers. So sometimes there are over a thousand bats. In a video we'll watch um, by News OK in a little bit, you will see that they give birth to one single pup in late June. And after they give birth to that pup, they'll fly every night to feed themselves and their babies until they're old enough, the babies are old enough to fly with them and then they'll migrate back to Mexico until it's time to come back and have pups again. Um, like I said, like the video said earlier, bats are nocturnal and they use echolocation so that they can fly around. If they were not able to use that echolocation, they would fly into everything around them and it would not be a good thing. So this is the video by News OK. This is actually one of the park rangers at the Alabaster Cavern. Um, and she gives a brief description of an event you can actually attend during uh, one of the bat flights. Solomon Bat Cave was purchased by the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife in 1995. And the primary reason was to protect this cave um, for all time because it is one of four maternity caves of the Mexican free tail bat in our state. So that was real important. Well, when uh, they first arrived, it's about half a million pregnant female Mexican free tail bats. They give birth to one pup, so the population doubles. So according to my math, I think that's a million something around there. They are actually focused on getting out and away. Thanks to Doppler radar, we know that the bass from Salmon Bat Cave will go out 60 miles and back, so 120 miles round trip each night hunting insects. Um, they hunt. This is a, a bat that is not going to be eating mosquitoes. They are hunting too high off the ground for mosquitoes. They're eating beetles and moths, flying ants. They will actually stay in the area and consume all these insects that are very happy up here. And about the end of August, 1st of September, they start migrating back. There's a couple of things going on when the bats come out. The, the first the group that's coming out are the females, and they are very organized in their emergence. It looks like a, a river of bats. And that organized uh, streaming actually is energy conservation. They're using the lift off of each other's wind that's created, and their goal is to get up far out away from this area to hunt insects. They leave the pups, the, the one, the pups will come later, uh, the area closest to the cave for them to forage in. Uh, up until last year, it was 45 minutes for them all to get out. Uh, last year, it was an hour and 15 minutes for them all to get out. Um, don't know if the population's growing or maybe another, bats from another maternity cave are starting to use this cave. Don't really know, but there's a lot of bats.
Hopefully they see a beautiful gypsum bluff area, sand sagebrush prairie. It's a very unique kind of prairie. And actually get to see all these bats flying out over their heads. They're actually watching something that has been taking place in exactly the same way for well over a hundred years. Where else can you see something like that anymore? It's a very, very special night. Awesome. So I hope that you enjoyed that video also. Like I said, she described what happens at flight and there's actually, you can register for that event. I think they only take a certain number of people each year for those events. But if you plan ahead, if that's something that your family would like to do, I think that you would very much enjoy it. So we as Thick Descriptions have taken several groups of students to Salabaster Caverns and these are some pictures. Um, so these caves are hundreds of years old. Um, Oklahoma, Oklahoma only bought the cavern to make it a wildlife center about a hundred years ago. But before that, there were actual caves that were around. Um, so here are some pictures. They have gone in and placed stairs in there so that you could go around and actually look inside the caves. Um, the pictures that these are from, there were actually no bats in the cave at this time because we went at the time that they were not in, um, hibernating for um, the season. Uh, they also, like the video, the News OK video said, they are known for their gypsum. So if you look around the grounds, Around the caverns, you'll see these gypsum rocks, and they're very precious. Um, here's another picture of just the wall, and if you look very closely, this is around this area right here is where the bats will hang, and there will be, like, you sometimes will not even know that there's so many bats because they're so pushed together because, they, like she said, there's sometimes more than a million bats in their caves. All right, so now it is craft time. You should have a toilet paper roll. You should have two googly eyes. You should have a brown pipe cleaner for your bats. And then you should have two of the brown pipe cleaners. And you should also have a piece of construction paper. The first thing we're going to do is fold our construction paper in half like a hamburger. And then you're going to draw on your construction paper. The easiest way to make your wings is to start at the edge of where you folded it. So not the open edge, but this edge. And then you're gonna make like a little hump and then another one and go down. So it'll, you'll have that. And then a little farther down, you'll make a little hump up there. And then you're going to give your bat wings like some deep curves and then make it match at the bottom. Then you're going to take your scissors and cut that out. And even if your bat wings aren't perfect, maybe a parent can help you or somebody around you, or you can try it a second time if they don't look perfect for you. Miss Allison does not draw perfect, but that's okay because she just tried. And even if they aren't perfect, we know that they're supposed to be bat wings. Now, after I cut it out, I'm going to have something that looks like this. Now, you can keep them like this, or you can cut them apart. I'm choosing to cut mine apart. And then you're going to just put those to the side. Now, you are going to take your toilet paper roll and color it if you have a color. If not, that's okay, too. Um, I, would, I would color mine because I like to color, but that's okay if you don't. Um, so we're going to put that down now, and I'm just going to use this one. You're going to now take your glue dots and place two glue dots where you want your eyes to go. 
So I'm going to put one right here. I'm going to put one right here. And this is where my eyes will be. So we're almost there. Uh-oh. So I got my eyes and I'm actually going to bend my legs so that they are not super long. You can also cut them. If your scissors aren't strong enough, I would just bend them. But for your legs, you're going to make a space in your toilet paper rolls so you can thread those through. And the easiest way to make those legs would be to bend that and just cut a little hole in there under your eyes. I'm going to take my legs and put them in there. You may have to push, but that's okay. So I got one leg. And another leg. And you can make your legs as small as you want to. Mine are long. So now we got our eyes and our legs. Now we can put that back down. And we're going to get two more glue dots and go ahead and add our wings. And I want my wings to be right behind my eyes. And if you kept your wings without cutting them, this might be easier for you. You just need one glue dot. But now I have my wings, my eyes, my legs, and then this brown pipe cleaner. We are going to eat. You can call this a tree lamp or you can set it as the wall of the cavern. And we're going to take our bats and just simply hook them on to our limb and you have your back craft. Yay! Now of course this is nighttime because our bats are not flying but I hope that you enjoyed making this craft and that is the end of our lesson. Thank you guys so much. I hope that you learned a lot. Remember, you can visit the caverns near Freedom, Oklahoma at any time throughout the year. But if you actually wanna see vets, I would, I would suggest you going in the springtime when they are actually there and hibernating. Thank you again, bye.